favorite group ever. Oh my God, I am just in love with you. I knew when that started playing that we were never gonna get you guys settled down because I have never seen this kind of energy at an event. So I am so happy and lucky to be here with you all today. <laughs> And, and, and I really, I have to laugh about what it was that brought me to this stage in this moment, which is basically, like I said, I was an investigative reporter and I did very well as a reporter until the day when I was working in Denver. I know I got some Denver people here. And I was working for the Rocky Mountain News and I got a brand new boss hole. And I know many of you are in this business because you too have had the love of a good boss hole, right? <laughs> and this guy, it didn't matter what I did, he told me, you will never be more than you are right now. You'll only be a reporter. And I did a typically female thing, which is to, you know, just hunker down, work really hard for a couple of years trying to impress him and win him over. And Two years pass, I get a promotion, I go to the first news meeting with all the editors and my boss says, Fawn's the new Night City editor, and the boss hole who's gotten a couple other promotions says, oh no, she's just a reporter. And it was humiliating as you might imagine and I had to figure, do I sit here or what? And I just remember going back to my desk, picking up the phone and calling the editor of the Tampa Tribune who had been trying to recruit me for four years. And I said, if you're gonna do it, you need to do it right now. And he put together a package. I left Denver and I went to Tampa. Now leaving Denver was hard because I had security or perceived security. I had a good 401k. I had five weeks of time off, union protected job. I just worked for a jerk. And I, kept, and I lived in the Rockies, I had lots of friends, and a friend said something to me, which you're gonna see again in a minute. She said, don't let security be your dangerous anchor. She repeated that, don't let security be your dangerous anchor. And because of her, I quit, I went to Tampa, took a management job, I'd never done it, and as a leader, I absolutely sucked because I think I was a boss hole because I just, all of my bosses had been men and I just did what they did and that doesn't work real well for women. So I looked for a book telling me how to be effective as a woman in a male dominated environment and there wasn't anything. And a friend said, well, you're a journalist, write it. And I said, I am so sick of people writing books about things they know nothing about. But I thought about it and I am a journalist and I can get to anyone. And no one had gone to the strongest women leaders of our time and said, what did you learn the hard way that can make it easier for the rest of us? And I quickly got great women in this book. Academy Award winners, Olympic athletes, Nobel Peace Prize winners, CEOs, presidents of countries, prime ministers, just all of our heroes. And the one thing they kept saying is that if you're going to truly succeed, you have to make peace with risk and bet on yourself. And they kept saying it. And the day came when I did an interview with Sylvia Earle, the oceanographer, and she described why it was so important to take a risk and how she had taken one just a few years earlier in her mid-60s, bet every dime she had on a business so that people like us could drive at the bottom of the sea in little submersibles. And her friend was the CEO that she chose, and it be went belly up in two years. And I said, wow. She said, yeah, he ran it in the ground. I said, I bet that made you bitter. And she said, no, look what I learned. And she rattled off a list of 10 things that she learned in that process. And she said something to me, which I'll never forget, and I hope you never forget, because it's really important you hang on to this. She said, I can always make more money. We think if we fail, we'll never make another dime. But where we fail is when we don't try because we can always make more money. We're smart, right? We're no dummies. And so I quit my job and bet on myself as an editor to write, write this, this book. And I had a plan. 
It's really important that you have a plan for your success. It is. My plan was that I would do all these interviews with great women, write my proposal, get an agent who would then market this, and there'd be a huge bidding war for my, my book, and then it would sell for the high six figures, maybe seven, and then I would turn in the book in six months, and then at nine months it would come out, and then I would have this phone call in the middle of the night from this woman who would say, hello, Fawn, this is Oprah. I loved your book, please, I'm sending a Learjet for you, be on the show tomorrow. And I would be whisked off to the Harpo Studios where Oprah and I would get on so well that she would have me for dinner that night in the condo with her and Stedman and Gail. That was the plan. By all means, have a plan for your success. Write that down because it is the greatest piece of fiction you will ever write in your life. <laughs> life does not unfold according to plan. My book, Hard Won Wisdom, was rejected by every major publisher in the United States. And when I moved a couple of years ago, I found the file folder that had all those rejection letters in it that made it so evident that I would never be successful with my dream. I don't know what kept me moving, but it's this thing, one foot in front of the other, right? And I kept trying and believing in myself. And it sold finally, because I figured out what I had to do to repackage it. And then I got my first copy on September the 10th, 2001. So 9-11 happened and my book tour got canceled, and I felt this very strange sensation, relief. Because if I could blame my book's failings on Osama bin Laden, <laughs> it was a lot better than saying my book sucked. <laughs> and really, like all of you, I had that same sadness and malaise after 9-11 of, of what had happened to humanity. And, a, you know, my book tour got canceled, and a week and a half after 9-11, the head of community affairs for the Borders Bookstore in South Tampa called me. Now, I lived in North Tampa at the time. She says, we got a very strange email from your publisher. And I said, well, what did it say? She said, it says, understandably, the author has decided not to tour at this time for security purposes. She says, so you can't make it from North Tampa to South Tampa? <laughs> I said, of course I can. She says, then why are you giving up? You will get moments in your life where it seems like you need to slow down or give up. And you have to say, why am I buying into this? She said, I know every person you need to know in borders in the country. Get out there and fight for your book. And I did. I took a legal pad and I put the names of all my friends in journalism who had moved all over the place and thought, I'm going to go on a mooching tour of the United States. Because <laughs> it had taken three years for that book to come out. And by that time, I was flat broke. And a lot of you know what it's like to start your new business with nothing. That's where I was. I had a little rented Ford Escort, fortunately gas was cheap then, went everywhere. And my book became a bestseller because of my friends. And this is something I want you to remember, your friends and family will always get you there, right? They'll get you there. So they had contests to prove how much they loved me by buying the most copies of Hard Won Wisdom. And my one friend bought 25 hardcover copies at $25 a piece, and she won the contest. <laughs> but what that did, it made it a bestseller, and then I started writing my letters to Oprah. I wrote 29 letters to the Oprah Winfrey people. My agent said, Fawn, you're obsessing. I said, Caroline, 29 is not obsessing. 30 <laughs> is obsessing. And after, I don't know which one of them worked, but Oprah had my book, and she had four of the women from it. She didn't have me on it. I was so mad. I kept holding out, thinking that by the 
the end of her show, I would be on there, because I knew we were going to be best friends when we met. <laughs> Fawn, Ianla, Oprah. We would be like just hanging out all the time, but it didn't happen like that. Instead, I got this great endorsement quote, which I have milked and continue to milk every day. So that is great. All of it from a book that was supposed to fail. And when, if you did see the video that opened up, it's my motto, fall down seven times, get up eight. Because it's not what happens to you, it's what you do to keep going. So what I thought I would do in talking to you today is talk a little about how you can gain some power, boost your self-esteem, and really, really ratchet it up. Because I know you all can do anything, and I'll show you why. So the first thing we have to do is start here. What is that a picture of? Huh? <laughs> the ruby slippers, yes. And I love this image because poor Dorothy, she went through a nightmare, didn't she? I mean, Dorothy, she's like going, she's gets all those nasty witches and she goes on the yellow brick road and she meets the scarecrow and the tin man, the cowardly lion. Everything's going to be fine if she can just get to Oz so she can get back to Kansas. And she's going through and they got all those little munchkins. What, what, not munchkins. What? They were munchkins? Why was I thinking donuts? <laughs> it's because I didn't eat a breakfast this morning. So anyhow, yeah, she's got the munchkins and, and um, they, she goes through this insanity and then you find out that the wizard is just a loser. Right, he is just crazy. And that her only way to get out of there is in this hot air balloon that he's got. Remember this? So they're in the town square and she's ready to go. And as she's going, Toto jumps out and she reaches over and goes over to get Toto. And the nincompoop can't operate his balloon so he takes off and she's stuck. You know, and the, the scarecrow's got his brain and the Lion's got his courage, and the Tin Man's got his heart, and Dorothy's stuck. Nothing's going to happen. Until all of a sudden, we see a little balloon coming toward the bubble, and inside the bubble is Glinda the Good Witch. <laughs> and Glinda says, all you have to do is click your heels together three times and say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. No place like home. And then you get to go home. And Scarecrow's like, really? <laughs> Why didn't you mention this a little earlier? And Glinda the Good Witch says, because she had to learn it for herself the hard way. Otherwise, she wouldn't have believed it. So many of you are younger than I am. You can learn it the hard way, or you can listen to me. <laughs> okay. You have incredible power in you. It is mostly unused. You have the ability to do anything you want, just click your heels together. I promise you this is true. And some people spend their whole lives learning this thing. I have a friend who lives on the beautiful Wikiwachi River here. It's clear to the bottom. Yeah, it's, it's just gorgeous. It has a beautiful deck there. And she's a southern woman, so she was raised to be hospitable. And everybody goes and mooches off of her, right? And she's now in her 70s and is a little tired of playing a hostess. So one day she calls me and she goes, Danny's coming again and bringing her mother. I said, well, tell her don't bring her. I can't. Yeah, you can. She comes every year for 10 days, sits on the patio, on the deck, doesn't do, any, do anything, just sits there, smokes cigarettes, doesn't lift a finger, sits on her butt. I said, tell her not to come. I can't. Yes, you can. I can't. Yes, you can. I can't. And I tell her something that I want you to remember, because this, this is true. It took me a long time to learn this. Most of what is out of control of, in our life can be fixed by an uncomfortable conversation. And we will do anything to avoid making somebody uncomfortable. And an uncomfortable conversation generally takes 
between three and 15 minutes. And we will be miserable for years because we don't want to have a three to 15 minute uncomfortable conversation, right? And isn't it smarter to just have the conversation? I said, Granny, it's three to 15 minutes. I can't do it. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. I can't do it. Yes, you can't. I can't. So, you know, two weeks come. And she's getting ready to come. I'm dreading it. Tell her not to bring her mother. I can't do that. Yes, you can. I can't. All right, fine. But remember this. If you don't do it, they're coming next year, too. <laughs> And there's dead silence on the phone. And so <laughs> one morning, a couple days later, 7 AM, my cell phone rings. And I see it's her. And I pick it up. I say, what's going on? I did it. <laughs> I said, what'd you do? She said, I had an uncomfortable conversation. I said, really? What'd you do? She goes, I said, Danny, you are welcome to come here whenever you want. Just you. <laughs> Only you. I said, what'd she say? Nothing. I said, oh, but see, it only took, what, three to 15 minutes? She goes, nope, 15 seconds. <laughs> and there's a really good lesson in it. And I, t I always tell my own stories of things that happened to me because I can't stand those speakers who steal other people's material. But everything's a metaphor. And in your life, there'll be so many times when you can fix a problem if you just take the three to 15 minutes and have the uncomfortable conversation. And remembering that you have incredible power in you already. Power to love yourself, power to take risks and just go ahead and go for it. And in doing that risk taking, remember what I told you. It's about betting on yourself. We like security. But what if I had stayed in that job at the Rocky Mountain News that was union protected and I had all that vacation and great benefits? How many Denver people do we have here? Let's hear you loud. What happened to the Rocky Mountain News? And then went down. Yep, it no longer exists, thank you. I would have stayed in a secure job that would have led me to unemployment in an industry that was dying. Instead, I'm here with you all. You always get led to where you're supposed to go. Now, this is the DNA molecule. And I also want you to remember this. Because when you went to the awards ceremony last night, and when you went to other events, you've seen people who have sold millions of dollars of product, correct? And what do you think separates you from them? Hmm? Nothing. Well, one thing, and it's courage, okay? But I want you to know you are smart enough and strong enough to make it happen. Because like I said, I have interviewed some of the smartest, most accomplished women of our times, and I've learned they're just like the rest of us. What separates them is their ability to see a vision that says, I can do this, and having the courage to persevere and push through it. So remember, you've got what it takes. Everything you need is inside of you. Just click your heels together and make up your mind. You have amazing power. And this is something that was really an amazing moment in my life was the the woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize for the nonviolence movement in Northern Ireland, she's somebody who had become a mentor to me. And when I was thinking of quitting my job to write the book, she said these lines, you'll never learn to fly if you won't jump off the cliff. And that's where the magic happens. I promise you, it is scary going out there. But if you remember that no guts, no glory, if you don't decide to go big and take the chances, it won't happen, right? Do you think that the kind of success that leads someone to manage a team that can generate $23 million worth of business, does that just happen? What this person, is she in here? The, well, tell her she has a fan right here. 
and that she missed a great show, right? <laughs> no, that doesn't happen by accident. She made up her mind. Make up your mind and just go for it. Now, this is a picture of me doing what every 50-year-old does the day they turn 50, <laughs> which is get yourself a Groupon <laughs> and then go skydiving, right? In fact, this didn't happen too far from here, and you can't really tell in this. But I'm getting up there, and, and that, that's a crappy airplane, by the way. It, it's, you know, like you're hearing all kinds of noise. And, and I'm going up there, and I'm not scared at all. I said, God, I am going to dive fearlessly into this and every moment for the rest of my life. This is my mantra. I will dive fearlessly into this and every moment for the rest of my life. So I traveled in India. And, and I got to Dubai before India, and everything's in Arabic, and I'm, and I'm by myself, and I'm like, I will dive fearlessly into this and every moment for the rest of my life. However, walking into Dubai was easier than this, because when I did this, the guy said to me, okay, now when the time comes, I'm going to give you a signal. And when I do, I want you to scoot in between my legs, and I'm going to clip myself to you, and we're going to scoot out on the wing. See that little, tiny little bar there? We're going to scoot out there. And then I'm going to tap your shoulder, give me the OK sign, and we're going. I said, OK. I will dive fearlessly into this in every moment for the rest of my life. So the time comes, gives me the signal. I scoot in between his legs. He hooks me to him. We scoot out on the wing. He taps my shoulder. And I turn to give him the OK sign. And it is the first moment I smell this man's breath. <laughs> and it smelled like my tandem guy had just swallowed a whole fifth of Jack Daniels. <laughs> I said, OK, God. If I'm supposed to die this way, it's OK. Quick, all right. But what I'm going to do is dive fearlessly into this and every moment for the rest of my life. And we took off, and I'm okay. It all worked out. Of course, I wrote a nasty review on Yahoo and Google, but. <laughs> Other than that, it's a pretty good mantra for you because fear is the one thing that really gets in your way of achieving your greatest success. And there's nothing to fear. Now, I love this picture because the cat looks like my cat, Willie, and he behaves the way, same way, too. Willie is, he needs help. <laughs> but he looks in the mirror and hisses and sees the king of the jungle. And that's what I have to teach you how to do. Because the one big thing we have to give ourselves permission to do is truly love ourselves. Now, I never saw a better looking group of women than I saw with you guys last night, right? Can you believe that? It, I mean, you all were beautiful. But I know how we are as women, and I know that even though you were looking the best you can look, you found some flaws. Because what we tend to do is pick ourselves apart. And right now, it's a uh, little after 10.30 in the morning. And if I could hear every negative thing that you all have said to yourselves by 10.30 this morning, <laughs> this room would have noise in it that would be deafening. Doesn't matter, the most successful among you can tend to put things aside, but this is something we constantly do to ourselves. Often it has something to do with how we look. But the one thing I want you to remember is that negativity is not making you successful. And I'm going to give you some skills that will help you to be more successful and manage that. Um, I don't know if Beth is around here, but we want to start passing out these bookmarks I've got. I'm not sure if we have enough for everybody. Um, no? OK. Is there anybody from Pure Romance in the room? It's a corporate. Yeah. Me too. How about 
any of my meeting planners, any of you there? No? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, let's get those so that, that we go, because really, I want to teach you how to talk to yourself, okay? And I had this great, great awakening when I interviewed this woman, and this picture was taken in the 1970s. Her name is Christine Fugel Hughes, and this is a picture of her and her husband at their kitchen table packaging cayenne pepper into little capsules. And what that was was the beginning of Nature's Sunshine Vitamins. This is an empire she started with $150 and an idea. She had no college education and seven kids, but she believed in herself. And that company will turn a $500 million profit this year. I said, wow, you're amazing. And she, I said, so what, what's your leadership style? And she says, well, I get up in the morning and I go to the closet and I try to find something that fits me because I'm overweight. I said, well, wait a minute, let's talk about your weight, because that's always been my deal, you know, up and down and up and down, up. so let's talk about your weight, and she goes, oh. do you know I get up in the morning and I go to the closet and I try to find the one thing that fits me, and, you know, same haircut I've always had, put on my lipstick, I just try to do the best I can, and I said, Wow, so you've got self-esteem problems? She goes, oh, yeah. I said, wow. I said, um, so I just read this article about you, and it said that you have five homes, and you got everything that all of us are working so hard to achieve, and your reward for that isn't that you love yourself? And she goes, no. She goes, can you imagine what it's like to stand in front of a vitamin company and be fat? And it was, it was sad, and, and so I said, well, maybe you should get some therapy. She said, I could be in therapy for the rest of my life. I'll never fix this. What that did was fix my self-esteem, because I then started interviewing all of these truly accomplished people and found out that almost universally, they had self-esteem problems. And of the, I think 50 were in hard won wisdom, only five admitted or said that they had really good self-esteem, and I think four of the five were truly lying. <laughs> However, I did believe Jane Goodall. And when I saw the caliber of people who were owning up to self-esteem problems, I realized that that is the disease that we are inflicting on ourselves. And it's something we can completely control, because these are our heroes, right? And we think that there's nothing, we, this is what we're aspiring to be, and still they're hearing the same negative voices. So what is that telling you? It's telling you that the negative voice that's causing you to not love yourself completely and unconditionally is not real, and that you have to overpower it, and that you do have the power to work with what you've got. So I have to tell you, back when I was a reporter, I used to take great pride in the fact that I had never paid more than $30 for a um, dress. Yep. So I had this red dress, looks similar to this, and I bought it at Marshall's. And I was asked to go as a journalist at the Aspen Institute, go over there, and the Aspen Institute is a think tank where rich people get together to think. And it's a campus, it's not like this hotel, right? And that, that comes to play in the end. But so I, I drive out to Aspen for this event, and I'm singing in the car, and everything is good, until I get to the room at this campus, and I look in the mirror, and I realize that I have gained back every pound of the 40 pounds that I had lost. And I had a meltdown, right? I started crying. Like, you're such a fat pig. And then, I thought, well, the only thing you can do, and this is true, start, start over, which I've had to do many, many times. Start over. Just go on a diet tomorrow. And so I stopped crying. I got up early, and I went to walk the beautiful town of Aspen, which in the summer is just glorious. It's such fresh air, and the hot air balloons are lifting. And, you know, I was a little less organized for speaking men, so I cut it a little close. And I, I went and did my beautiful walk, and I get back to my room, and I wash my hair, and I get out of the shower, 
and realize that I neglected to remove my $29 cotton dress from the garment bag and that it was crumpled on this chair and when I pulled it out, it looked like a big wrinkled red Kleenex, right? <laughs> and I'm standing there, I'm naked, I got wet hair and I've got 15 minutes and I grabbed the iron. And remember, I'm at this campus, not a hotel, right? And of course, the iron is completely broken and I have a choice. I either don't go, I go late, or I wear the wrinkled red dress. And after consideration, I put on the wrinkled red dress and went into this think tank where everybody is wearing Chanel and Gucci, and I'm in my wrinkled $29 dress from Marshalls. And I thought to myself as I went in that room, I'm all I've got. And I can either let this drag me down or I can ignore it because it's only going to get worse if I buy into it. So I'm going to pretend I have the best outfit in the room. And I get on this panel and I am so funny. I am so funny. And it's the panels run by Fred Friendly from PBS. Daniel Shore from CBS is on it. The head of the Denver Post is there. Uh, Jill St. John, the actress, is on this panel. And when it's over, Fred Friendly awards me the Most Valuable Player Award. Some lady wants to fix me up with her son. <laughs> and the best is that the editor of the Denver Post tried to get me to go work for the Denver Post. And like a dum-dum, I didn't, right? But it was this really great lesson because I went with what I had and that it really doesn't matter where we are or who we are, we are all walking around with a wrinkled red dress. We can either focus on the things that aren't perfect in ourselves or go with what we've got, because I promise you, whatever it is that you've got is good enough. If you wanna do more, you have it in there, inside of you, to do everything. And so why not? Ignore your flaws, because they're probably not laws at all. And you know, another thing, so what if they are? I did a keynote for NASA one time, and my pants were too long, and I tripped on stage, like boom, right, face plant. And the whole audience went, oh! And I held up my hand, I said, just a minute, you like me better because I tripped. And they cheered, because we are all flawed in our own way. All we can do is work with what we've got, and I assure you, you've got enough working for you. Okay, we still don't have the bookmarks. They're, oh, they're going around? Yay, okay. So here's my thing, and uh, I love hearing from people. So if you get the bookmark, it's got my email on it. Otherwise, go to fawngermer.com and you can get my email address and I'll send you a download to something. But it's really the power of affirmations. Now, y'all are young. I don't know how many of you remember Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and he was just like, gosh darn it, I'm strong enough, I'm smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like me, right? Well, there is an absolute science to affirmations. And it is this, if you tell yourself something enough times, even if it is not true, you begin to erase the negatives on your hard drive and replace them with positives, okay? So that you can overwrite the negative. And they've done studies on this. Like if you say, I am getting thinner by the minute, and if you say it 50 times the first day, in fact, for two weeks, 50 times a day, and then the second week, 25, or third week, 25 times a day, fourth week, 10 times a day, it overwrites what you knew before, and even though it's not true, you're doing nothing to change your behavior, you will start to lose weight because you will start eating less. So when you look at what you're polluting your brain with, with the negativity, I can't, or I'm not like her, or I wish I could, and instead say, I am unbelievably successful, I feel sorry for that woman who only has $23 million of business. <laughs> You put the positive in, you get the positive out. Conversely, if you put the negative in, what are you gonna get? 
If you limit yourself, you limit yourself. There's this thing called the law of attraction. I am a big believer in it. Um, I, there's a book called Think and Grow Rich, and it's very out of date, and there are things in it that are so politically incorrect, you know, but the concept being your thoughts are things, and by reading that book, it really made me successful when I was starting my, my speaking business. It was a very important book. Then The Secret came out. And many of you have heard of the book The Secret. Well, I didn't like The Secret because I thought that's just stolen from Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. But then I realized he stole it from Francis Scoville Shin, and I think she stole it from the Bible. So <laughs> I don't care where you get it from. What it is is saying your thoughts are powerful. If you expect difficulty, what are you going to get? Right. If you expect trouble, what are you going to get? If you expect you're going to find a way, what will you do? Right. So take charge of your brain. And, and when I say take five, I think 10 is a really good number of affirmations, anywhere from seven to 10. And that when you repeat those seven to 10 affirmations, you write them down, it takes a total of five minutes a day if you do it 50 times. It does not take a lot of time to rewrite your inner script. It's just, sometimes we're not ready. And when my mother passed away, I thought I would be able to circumvent the grief. And I immediately wrote these great affirmations. I can deal with this alone. I, you know, I had all these things, but I was in too much pain to say them. So you have to be in a position where you can use them. And it's funny that at some point I heard this song that Chicago did, that the old man, and it's called Feeling Stronger Every Day. And there was a line in there. And I, I lost my dad right after my mom, three years ago tomorrow. And um, so it was two months, two and a half months apart. And when I finally got that line, knowing that you would have wanted it this way, I do believe I'm feeling stronger every day. And I probably said it a thousand times a week. And it did give me comfort. So the, the caveat with affirmations is you've got to be open to receiving the message. But I promise you they will work. And I do volunteer work with battered women, and I, that's the first thing I do is I help them to write the affirmations they need, and they stick them to their mirrors, and they've said them for years, and they, they, they really have learned. They're my proof. But I promise you, this will make you more successful. So, and like I said, you have to have a plan. I just want you to remember it's fiction. It just gives you a little bit of direction. It might make you feel more comfortable. But the bigger achievement Oh, okay, is remembering that if you are doing what makes you comfortable, you are greatly limiting your success because the magic happens far away from your comfort zone. It's where you don't feel comfortable. It's where you don't know what to do. And I promise you, when you're trying new things and you're uncomfortable, a year from now, you'll be bored doing that. It'll be okay. You have what it needs. You just need to believe in yourself. Now, I want to come down and see you all because I love you. I hope this will still work from here. Now, this woman in this picture is Catherine Switzer. Hi, everybody. Oh, hey. Oh, my people. Hey. Go Broncos. Let's hear it for the Super Bowl champions. So anyhow, Catherine Switzer is, hi. <laughs> Anybody want a selfie? I tell you what, you put this on the website, right? All right, everybody stand up. Okay, come here. Come. Oh, now you got to squat because you're right in front of my face. <laughs> a little more. Okay. okay. Uh oh, he's got to put a wide angle lens. Let the other camera guy go. Who's on my butt? Hey, we got in the middle down here. I'm still on my tiptoes. Okay, quick. Okay. Squat a little more. Squat a little more. 
Okay, perfect. Perfect, thank you. There you go. <laughs> you want to watch? Yes! Center. Oh, okay. Well, this is getting, I will continue to tell my story as we're setting up, because I don't want you to miss any of the excitement. Oh, somebody's drink. Ooh. Uh-oh. We're your Tampa It's okay, I'm just glad that I didn't I do it. Coffee. Okay, so, so anyhow, this woman in the picture, she's the... Okay, come on. Okay. Okay. This woman is very historic. She's the first woman who, um, what you got? Breakfast. Oh, you are so sweet. She gave me my breakfast. Yes. I love you. I love you for that. Oh my God, I love all of you. I do. I just, you know, you got to really love your work and enjoy it while you're doing it. And I, I like, I'm going to keep you till four o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> no, okay, so she's the first woman to run the Boston Marathon officially. And she signed up using her initials, KV Switzer. So they didn't know a woman was going to be running the race. And you see the guy on the first one, he's trying to pull her off the course there. And her burly boyfriend is pushing him away. And then she's the first to register and finish the Boston Marathon. And when I interviewed her for Hard One Wisdom, I said, that's amazing. And she teaches so many women how to be physically fit. And I said, what do you tell somebody who might be 100 pounds overweight on how to start? And it is such a great story for how to make change in your life. She said, I say, put on your shoes. Because it always begins with one step. And we're not talking about weight loss here. We're not talking about exercise. Whatever you want to do for your life, just start it. Just move forward. Don't waste time. Because you'll find that one foot in front of the other gets you where you need to go. And that's a very important thing that I learned in that year, in the three years, when I was having trouble getting my book published is to recognize an obstacle. And instead of seeing a stop sign, it's an obstacle. So you say, oh, this sucks. What am I going to do? There is always something you can do. And it's not going to be what you expect. And I tell you something, it was so much harder for me to become successful than I had planned. But the reward was 10 times greater. Because if I hadn't had my book rejected by every major publisher, and gone through this identity con you know, crisis, trying to figure out what am I going to do if I can't do that. And if I hadn't had the 9-11 thing, if I hadn't had that boss hole, if all of these negative things hadn't happened, I would not be here. And if it had been easier to publish, I'd have had a middleist book and would have had to go back to a newsroom working into a, an industry that was in complete decline. Your obstacles can make you great. In fact, they probably will. And instead of resenting them or being afraid of them, dive fearlessly into this and every moment of your life. And I like this. Because some people say, you got to know your limits. I'm like, uh-uh. There are no limits. You know, if you are not failing a little bit, you're nowhere near your limits. Failure is, we are so scared of that, right? But we don't learn if we aren't going out there into that discomfort zone. And we really have one mission here in life, and that is to learn. To learn. And I love this picture. <laughs> He's trying so hard, right? I mean, he is so precious. And I love this picture because he's getting clocked in the head. And what is that dog going to do the next time somebody throws a ball to him? Is he going to hide or is he going to go for it? And I want you to remember that visual, because you're going to get clocked in the head sometimes. You just have to keep going for it. And, and when I was getting rejected as an author, my neighbor said to me, just remember, the more you put through the top of the filter, the more it comes out of the bottom. And it was, just keep trying. The more you try, something's going to break through. So just have the courage to keep trying. And remember that it's the lesson that is most important of all. This is Derek Redmond who was running in the Olympics in Barcelona a million years ago. And what is so beautiful about his story is that as he was running the race, he snapped his Achilles tendon. 
And he, uh, you know, I mean, he was not even going to be able to finish this thing. But he had worked so hard, and he's just trying to drag himself forward. And this other man is his father, who ran down from the stands and walked him over the finish line. And that became the iconic photo of the Barcelona Olympics. Who won that race? Who cares? Because who won that race? And there will be times when it's that lesson for you. And when it's the real victory is the support you're getting from your friends and family, or the knowledge that you did everything you could when you hit the wall. Because you can. You can. You can do anything and everything because it's all there inside of you. You just have to keep moving forward. And I, I love this. This is a, a quote from Winston Churchill. If you're going through hell, keep going. Because sooner or later, you're going to get to the other side of it. It's just, unfortunately, we don't get an email telling us when the misery is going to end. And I, I've asked for that many times. Go. Go. Yeah. OK, you never know how close you are to turning the corner until you turn the corner. I didn't know how close I was with my book until it sold. And like I say, I like to tell a lot of stories that are really good metaphors. And I'm telling you something about my life in Colorado. I, I, this is years ago. I'm a big cyclist. And I would cycle in the mountains. And on this particular day, I was doing a week-long bicycle tour. And I wasn't in my best shape. I weighed over 200 pounds. This involved gaining, I, I think, like 9,000 feet of altitude in a 97-mile day, and it was hot, and I, I just was having such a time going. This is the Grand Mesa. It's the worst ride of my life. And I am not a quitter, but on this particular day, I knew I had met my match, and that there were people quitting on this ride right and left. And the SAG vehicles, the SAG wagon is what you quit and they put you in there and you sag your way to the top. And my motto had always been death before sag, but I knew that that mountain was more than I could, could handle. And you know, I've always said that everything I learned in life, I learned on the seat of my bicycle in the Rockies. I learned that you always need to keep your eye open for what's going on behind you because someone is always trying to run you off the road. I learned you don't worry about those clouds over there until they're over here because you can worry about a lot of things and it may not even rain. I learned that when a woman passes a man, he will kill himself to get back in front of her. <laughs> and when I'm talking in a mixed group, the guys bristle. And then I say, and when some of the best feminists I ever met, when confronted by a flat tire, will stand helplessly at the side of the road waiting for some guy to change the tire. And then the guys feel better. But I'm thinking in my head, who's smarter? <laughs> right? But on this particular day, I learned about moving forward and how hard it can be. So like I said, it was hot. I wasn't in shape. People are quitting right and left. And I, I finally knew I was going to have to quit. And I thought about it, and it's like, well, how am I going to quit? Because if you're going to quit something, you really need to think about it instead of just quitting. And I thought, I am going to go as far as I can, as far as I can possibly go before I quit. And even if I have to slow down to a pace where you know, I'd stop and take a break every mile, I'm fine with that, because I'm going to keep going until I can go no more. So I'm going up, and I, I decide I'm going to stop and recover. And I stopped for an hour and a half. I hydrated. I sat there on the ground. And by the time I got back on my bike, you know what it's like when you're exercising and you stop and then you start again. Didn't feel real good. But I got on there, and I start pedaling back up the mountain. And as I'm going, I see Harold and Sue. And they were older than me, probably about as old as I am right now. And they're on a tandem. And I hear him say, I told you you weren't in shape. 
I said, Sue, I'd stop pedaling and make him haul your butt up that mountain. <laughs> and then, let's see, then I go up, oh, this is, this is prime. So I'm suffering through this. I'm, by this point, I'm stopping every two miles. I'm going so slow. And this skinny little blonde thing comes up beside me. And she looks at me and she goes, I'm so proud of you. she speeds off and it's getting slower and slower and then I start stopping every mile and I realize that's it I can quit with dignity and that's the only thing you got to make sure you go as far as you can go because you're gonna have to quit I can quit with dignity and I, you know I come and I see one more turn and I'm gonna get up a, around that hairpin so that I'm not gonna get run over by somebody and then I'm gonna pull over and when the sag back wagon comes, I'm going to put my hands on my helmet, which is what you're supposed to do, and they'll stop and pick me up. And I got around that corner, and that is what I saw. Oh! What? <laughs> Not him. <laughs> Not that. Not that. Not that. That. I made it. You never know how close you are to turning the corner until you turn the corner. So all you can do is just keep moving forward at your own pace. Just keep trying. Don't give up because you'll get there sooner or later. And in doing this, I want you to remember things about your life because I really believe we're here having an amazing learning experience. And I was doing a radio interview a few weeks ago, and the guy's going through my LinkedIn profile, and he's reading everything I did, and he goes, oh, this is so impressive, and he's going on and on, and I said, you know, to be honest, when they write my obituary, here's what I want them to say. She had a lot of friends. She was a great daughter. She was loved, and she loved. She was a very accomplished cyclist, and an outstanding kayaker. And she wrote books, spoke, and was a reporter. I'm not my work. My work is very important to me. But life is a really important big picture experience. And no matter what we're doing, we're learning. We're learning to be better versions of ourselves. And so don't lose sight of it. You're not defined by what happens to you. You're defined by who you are. And those lessons are the best lessons. Okay. Yeah, I love you guys. You give me so much attention. So this is Brenda Barnes. And her story is so amazing because Brenda at one point was the most powerful woman in American business as CEO of PepsiCo North America. And in 1997, she wanted some time with her kids because they were growing up too fast. So she quit this very visible job to take a time out. And when that happened, the media skewered her because she became an example for why women can't have it all. And they just said, you know, thanks a lot, Brenda. But she took this time out and for seven years was with her kids. And as they were ready, they were, you know, they got to that point where kids stopped talking to their parents. Then she went back to work. And because she had done some work on corporate boards, she was still had her, her toes in the water, she became the CEO of Sara Lee Corporation. Now, when I say Sara Lee, you think of? Cakes. Cakes, right. But Sara Lee was a giant holding corporation, so it was pound cake and cheesecake, but it was Hanes, it was Playtex, it was Hillshire, it was 40 different brands. And she went through this business and said, this company will die if we don't spin off about 35% of our company, and it's going to die quickly. And the, the board was behind her, but the stock plummeted. So imagine the pressure that she was on. And one day, and I interviewed her when she was in the middle of that, one day she went to the gym, and she was working out, and got off the bench press. And when she tried to stand up, she just collapsed. And she never worked another day in her life because she had a really dangerous brain bleed. 
and young. She was, you know, late 50s when this happens. And she didn't know that that was going to happen. And what if she hadn't taken that time out with her kids to prioritize what mattered to her? And then when she got sick, her kids dropped everything to take care of her for a year. And she still has significant paralysis, but she's grateful she's alive. She's just a very inspiring woman, but she can't work. And it's such a reminder that we can get so caught up in the chaos of the day that we forget about living our lives. So I want you to remember that. What matters most? Always have that list of your priorities and make sure that you're allotting your time accordingly. Unfortunately, work eats up a lot of our time, but of your spare time, don't be lost to Facebook if you're not having enough time with your kids. Always know consciously what you're doing with your time because you are making choices on how to live and your choices have consequences. Your choices have consequences. So, and it's important that when you get too caught up in it, you go outside and catch your breath. Okay? Just take a breath. Have you ever noticed that you can work, 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 and if you don't leave the house, the day is invisible, it never happened? But sometimes if you just go outside, see the sunset, it's beautiful. I always say never waste a sunset. And try to control your worry because that is not helping, is it? And I don't, people say there's a study, 70% of what you worry about never happens. Who does a study like that? They don't know. But <laughs> I'm willing to bet it's probably closer to 90% of what we worry about never manifests, right? And so what good is it doing me? I, I, I did an interview for somebody, with somebody in Mustang Sally's, and she said, learn to schedule your worry time. I said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, you look at a problem, and you decide how much worry is this worth, and you allocate the time accordingly. So that if it's a 20-minute problem, say that you will worry about it between 9 and 9.20. And if you miss your window, you have to wait another day. <laughs> and that, that works, except for the worst of our problems. So keep that in mind. Try to control your worry. And remember this, because when I say about the deeper meaning, on a soul level, our daily dramas are absolutely meaningless. When you're developing that soul, that reason you are here, you're defining yourself as a person. So that's the heaviest lifting you're going to do in your life. It's the most important. So always use that to ground yourself because when you start thinking about what you're experiencing and learning as a human, it's a lot easier to let go of the stress that is bogging you down. Uh-oh. I messed something up. Oh, I know what he did. I did this before. Okay. Hang on. Ah! Is that where I am? Yeah. So, and, and th this is the best lesson I can give you. Because my mother had a stroke when she was 66 years old and became paralyzed. And then, years into that, she had Alzheimer's. And so she suffered for a very long time, but she had a lot of joy in her life, so it's not, a, it's not that kind of a, a sad story. I learned so much from her. The other thing I learned was that whenever something started going dark, it was up to me to make it go light. Because you can feel bad about things as much as you want, but the, the better you get at this accept, cope, and adapt, the more you're going to live a happy, joyful life. It's your greatest coping skills, accept, cope, and adapt. Because if I could say, okay, um, she's repeating herself a hundred times a day, but at least I can hear the sound of her voice because I knew that day would come when I couldn't. And at least she's still alive. Accept, cope, and adapt. And remember this. As we are learning, it's really like the dominoes falling because if every bad thing that happened in my life hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here with you all, right? And how cool is this? So it all works out. It does. It will lead you where you need to go. So you have to have faith in that. And then I want you to learn the power of reset. Reset is something that I had to learn because I had an unbelievably bad year. I had really good coping skills, but then came 2013. And my mom died, and the next day I had to speak for Deloitte in Dallas and it hadn't hit me, so I did a great job. 
And they invited me to come back one year later when I would be going to the same hotel with the same people on the anniversary of my mom's death, at which point I realized I was very depressed and needed to do something. And it's hard to be a motivational speaker and be depressed. So I remember it was like two in the morning and I'm like, I either need to get some meds or do something. Vince, are you ready back there? And I did something. This is the beginning of my big adventure. It's been raining all day. The clouds are beautiful. For now, there is no rain. So let's see what happens. Blowing crazy wind and I'm freezing already but I gotta make some miles today. That walk kicked my butt. It was just nonstop wind, it was horrible, but yet awesome. Shell is in honor of my father and my mother's memory, which was in my heart every step. This one is in honor of the walk, which brought me back to being myself. I'm happy. And I'm the only person on it at this point. It's just such a blessing. It's a gift. I feel like it's just for me. Great day. Just go a few miles at a time, you can go a long way. You don't have to do everything at once. I feel good. I feel solid. I feel like I learned something really important about which power we have over what holds us down. Because sometimes all it takes is a big change to make a big difference. So when I think about what I was thinking when I was out there, I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just living. Best audience, let me tell you. So when I learned from that, I, I got done and I was like, boy, I wonder how long this is going to last. And it lasted. That jolted me out of a depression and I started researching the concept of life re reset and reboot, which is that if you mark an end to something and you do something to consciously celebrate the change, you can make some change in your life. And this was a powerful lesson to me. So I wrote this book on it. And it was so personal, because as you can imagine, sharing a lot of that is, is hard. And the story was even more complex than, than that. And I couldn't let go of it, because I was like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, all these people are going to know my business. And then I thought, I'm going to let it go. And it, that has been my best-selling book so far, and in, it's going in its third printing in less than a year. And um, yeah, so. But the idea is, all is not lost. When you feel like you're at bottom, all you have to do is find a way to create hope and purpose. 
And when I was getting up, because I would ride my, or I'd do my walk, and I'd have my bicycle at the end of where I walked for the day, and I'd ride back to the car and then go home. And the next day, I'd pick up right where I left off and go the next chunk to my bike and then come back to the car and go home. By four days, I was waking up, and I'm like, where am I going today? Because I had purpose. And that is the key to reset. And it also it clears your brain. And you don't have to go walk the beach. I write about this. You know, If you want to knit for a week or go to a Buddhist monastery, I don't care what you do. It just needs to trip your breakers and give you your power to realize you're living your own life. So this is the best line I, I think I've ever written in my life. So I have to share it. There was a time when everything was just right in my life. I think it was a Tuesday in 1991. I slept so well that night. <laughs> because if you are waiting for everything to line up, it's not going to happen, right? I mean, let's be honest. If not, honest guy, it was 1991. I remember that night so well. And life is all about learning to rock and roll with it and to minimize the impact of the, the negative that comes toward us. And I want you to remember this so that it centers you. This is my friend, Bet. And when I could not sell my book, I was a member of a, our own little women's group. And we'd get together and we'd talk about things. And one time we got together and we did not have a topic for that meeting. And everybody's trying to figure a topic. And I blurred out the words, I don't know what my purpose is. If I'm not supposed to be the author, who am I? And that kind of landed with a thud. And then finally, Pam said, I don't know my purpose either. And Teresa, I don't know my purpose. And Tammy, I don't know mine. But I knew for sure Bet would be able to help us because she was in chemo for ovarian cancer. She had to know, and she just shrugged. And over the next year, I got my book out. Pam got a different job. Teresa and, and Tammy went back to school. And Bet lived her life. She lived every moment that she had. One time, we went kayaking off of Kaladesi Island, and it was in December. And you northerners might do something crazy like us, but Floridians do not jump in the water in December. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> she says, it's beautiful out. And you know, she was riding her waves. And as my, my book came out, she was able to go to my first signing. And that was a, a really exhausting thing for her to do. And when I came back from my book tour, she was starting to really go downhill. And it was amazing to watch how she lived that last life, but the last part of her life. And when I went, she, one day I saw her and she goes, yeah, I saw Jesus. I said, really? She goes, yeah. She goes, I'm not feeling so bad about this. I said, so you think you can get back to me sometime on how this Jewish thing's going to play out for me? <laughs> she goes, you are so brassy. And then the next time I saw her, she looked so sick. And you knew it was, it was really close to the end. And she couldn't talk anymore. And Pam and I were there. And I leaned over to her and I said, I just want you to get back with me and let me know one thing. She looks at me, I go, let me know if there's a super Walmart up there in heaven. <laughs> she rolled her eyes, right? Pam looks at me, she goes, Fawn, it's heaven. Of course there's a super Walmart. <laughs> So a few days later, she passed away. And her brother called me and said, can you write her obituary? And I said, absolutely. Because as a journalist, that's the most important thing we ever write, is the last word, the obit. And I was writing about what I learned from her as she died, because she really lived all out. And what a lesson and inspiration it was to so many other people. And I got done, and I was flying the next day to St. Louis for a speech. And I had to go get my hair cut and colored by someone who had never touched my head before. So <laughs> I'm driving, it's dark, I'm, I'm late because I was writing the obit, and I pass it. And so I do a UE, and I'm driving in one of those double turn lanes where it's got the two-way traffic, because I'm just trying to see the number. And somebody's suddenly coming right at me, and he's honking. 
screeching on his horn and there is no way for, we're for him to go or me to go. We're going too fast and we are going to be killed. Honest to God. It's like, ee! and then I think, oh my God. And then something opens up on his side and he starts into the traffic and flips me off and goes off into the night. And I get in there and I'm sitting in the parking lot and my, I'm just like, my heart is racing and it occurs to me that my friend had fought for two years to live every day of her life and I almost threw my life away by not paying attention. I wasn't paying attention. And think about how much time we are losing now to our electronics or our distractions. We're not paying attention. And what I learned from Bet about our purpose in life, because remember that was the big mystery, was our purpose in life is to live our lives, to pay attention, to be conscious about what we are doing. Because we've got one shot at it. There's no do-over. There's no do-over. And one day, one day I was up, I was kayaking early, the sun was coming up, and I thought, God, thank you so much for letting me live this life. And I heard something inside of me say, oh no, you chose to live this life. And I do believe in, in God. But every day, we make choices. We absolutely make choices on how we are going to live and fulfill ourselves. It is so important that we make that choice every day. Choose happy, choose happy, choose happy. Because you also have a choice to choose sad, or choose complaining, or choose dissatisfaction. You choose your life. I want you to remember that DNA. Because there is nothing that separates you from someone who's running a $23 million business other than courage and hard work. It's your choice. You have to have that self-esteem that I told you about. Don't bring yourself down with negatives that are not true. You have power inside of you to live a wonderful, beautiful, magnificent life. It's all yours. And with that, I challenge you to leave here a little bit stronger because remember, you're wearing those ruby slippers. All you have to do, all you have to do is click your heels together, pure romance. Make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. You all are the best. Thank you so much.